how did Ricardo Gonzalez come in contact with Galeo? Well, I think it started with an exchange of emails. And the exchange of emails went something like this, where I think, and he'll talk about it, I'm sure, with his, his uh, speech on leadership, uh, didn't quite see eye to eye on some of the tactics that we were doing here in Georgia. And, and I, we started exchanging emails, and I appreciated the fact that he started exchanging uh, emails and thoughts and ideas about what we were doing. And through that dialogue, we came to an understanding of some of the different tactics that maybe we need to be taking a look at. And the, the point to that is that through dialogue, we can reach mutual understanding. We can reach a mutual focus of where we want to move forward together. And, and I appreciate Ricardo, and I learned more about him. And as I learned more about him, I thought that you needed to hear uh, what he had to say as well. So Ricardo Gonzalez, thank you very much. Can we truly influence and can we truly inspire? And I want you to catch that word inspire. Can we inspire this country? And I think we can. And I want to talk with you about how we can do that. So I appreciate uh, your willingness to share this with me. And to inspire, we have to pause for a moment and we have to consider the nature of inspirational leadership. Bear with me one moment here. Uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer, I don't know if you've seen Dr. Dyer on PBS. He has a book out called Inspiration. And in the book he says to understand what it means to be inspirational or to be inspired, you need to just split the word in two. In spirit. Inspiration. So to inspire or to be inspired simply requires that somehow we walk in harmony with both natural and supernatural laws. And if we do not do that, we simply cannot inspire. The very word itself means to be in spirit. And these laws are not selfish. These laws have no borders. The only wall on this type of leadership is the one that's within our own souls. The only thing that keeps us from being inspiration in our leadership is frankly ourselves. Now, leaders who inspire, they make no division between the secular and the spiritual. And I know a little bit about this. I was in the ministry for 10 years. My first degree was in theology. I had five years of Greek and I studied counseling before I got into language and leadership training. And it's difficult. It's difficult to maintain a consistent leadership style that inspires, because it's difficult to stay inspired, correct? Just the grind of every day can get to us. Now, before I go on, I have to say, and I want to confess that there have been many times in my life when I have needlessly angered or offended people and certainly been very uninspiring. And um, I think all of us knows what it feels like that it's kind of this, this pain of this sense of self that all of us have inside of us. And we know it afterwards, but while we're doing it, sometimes we don't pause. I believe that an inspirational leadership model in the Latino community would be a model that both educates and elevates our people. It's a model, I think, that would reject our classist, patronish models of leadership that are deeply embedded in our heritage. And we all understand that, correct? My father is Puerto Rican. Y yo me considero puertorriqueño 100% pura cepa. Y de jíbaro de ahí Y yo amo Puerto Rico. Con todo mi corazón. My mother was from Kentucky. 
<laughs> and I am a Puerto Rican hillbilly. <laughs> You remember uh, Cher singing very uneloquently, uh, half-breed. Mita, mita. How many half-breeds do we have in the room today? Somos varios. Now, some of you were born and raised in the United States, and your immigrant ancestry is buried in generations past. And some of you are second and third generation Hispanics. And you are still struggling to find out how to properly live a balanced, bilingual, bicultural life. And that in itself is difficult. A few of you may actually be first generation Latinos here from other countries. And you left your countries, but your countries have not left you. Right? On the front of my guagua. <laughs> I have my license plate from Puerto Rico, and if you ever see Gol 401, that's me. <laughs> we have the CDs with the flags that hang from our rearview mirrors. And there's no music on the CDs, but the CDs bring music to our souls. And we never stop being Latinos, nor should we. It is our heritage. My father was one of 27. It's not a typo. 27 children from the mountains of Puerto Rico, the Aibonito. My father came to the United States with a ninth grade education, no English, at 16 years of old, age to the uh, part of Chicago that Jim Croce sang about, the side where Bad, Bad, Leroy Brown used to hang out, you know? <laughs> And after some fairly unprofitable business ventures on the south side of Chicago, my dad uh, moved to Elkhart, Indiana, worked in trailer factories, started a little business. The business grew, and it grew, and it grew. And my father retired at 45 years of age, and that inspires me. because I lived it and I saw it, and some of us in this room understand that we could never have accomplished in our countries what we have been able to accomplish in this great country. I met a man in Oklahoma City. We were doing an all-day conference for the FBI for the police force in Oklahoma City. And this man was Mexican and he had crossed the border and he went to Los Angeles to wash dishes. No English, no formal education. And he had a brother in Oklahoma City who went to get him out of Los Angeles and he took him to Oklahoma City to wash dishes. But at least it wasn't LA, huh? And this man, poco a poco, little by little, he began to open some little Mexican food restaurants, which by the way is what my father did. So there's money in Mexican food. <laughs> That's why they're serving it here this morning, see? <laughs> this man built several restaurants. He's now a city leader, not a Latino leader. He's a city leader. He has done something very atypical to our culture. He has helped 20 of his ex-employees start their own restaurants. And although they would compete with him directly, he helped them. And this man is extremely wealthy financially, but he is more wealthy in spirit. And he is typical of the leaders that we need to grow in our community. The pieces of pie are not limited. And we should educate and elevate our people and too many of us who quote unquote make it, we forget. And it's safe to say that many Anglos do not understand Latinos, correct? Safe to say that. 
And it's safe to say that many Latinos do not understand Anglos or African Americans or Asians or vice versa. It's safe to say that sometimes within our own ranks of Latinismo that we do not understand each other. Right? It is safe to say that within the Latino culture there do exist prejudices from country to country, correct? Let's be honest. Okay, we all know it. I was very pleased to sit here at breakfast with Puerto Ricanos. Lo que dañó la mesa era el cubano aquí que está. By the way, this cubano is my very dearest friend in life, and I love him like a brother. His parents are an inspiration. They have five children. His dad, very poor English. His mother, very little English. Came out of Cuba, professionals. Worked in the janitorial and cooking system of Tampa school systems. Five children, one's a doctor. One's a highly successful real estate agent here in Atlanta. Another one is a CEO of a very large tech company. Another one's a nurse and another one's a teacher. And that's a family. Now, I think it's very safe to say that this lack of cultural understanding, and this is an area that we do a lot of work in. We work in language and cultural management leadership training. So we see this all the time. These filters. My mother and my father were from two different cultures. One grandmother saying to me, Mira, Ricardito, ¿qué te pasa, muchacho? ¿Qué te pasa contigo, muchacho? Venga acá. And the other one, now, Rick. <laughs> now, Ricky, don't do that, Ricky. I was a confused little Puerto Rican. Hillbilly. <laughs> so my parents, in all of their union of 32 years, could not understand each other's cultural filters much less inspire one another. I think in a very real sense, at least in my own personal mission to bring together Anglos and Latinos for the common good, it's personal redemption every time we see it happen. And I think some of you are on the same page with me. I love both the Anglo culture and I love the Latino culture. And I want to encourage you to do the same. It is healthy. We can love both of our parents and we can love both of our cultures. They are not mutually exclusive. Now, out of this cultural misunderstanding and filters that we have, we have also seen an inability to achieve immigration reform. We see it in organizations who do not know how to properly recruit, hire, and train Latino workers. We see it in the construction industry. For every one Anglo who gets hurt, four Latinos get hurt in equal number ratios. Honestly, we see it in Latino entrepreneurs, many of whom do not know how to do business in the American mainstream system. We become very insular and we're comfortable doing business to one another. And we see it certainly in state and local governments taking responsibilities upon themselves which belong to the federal government. And it is simply because we have different cultural filters. I think it's important to recognize and understand and be honest with ourselves that these filters are real and they are sincere. We may not like the views of other people, but if we do not properly engage them, we will never influence them. We certainly will not inspire them. Now, I think we have to pause in our leadership and we have to ask ourselves a question. And it's a simple question. 
is this in spirit? Am I acting in harmony with natural, supernatural laws? Am I acting in spirit? We have to pause. We have to think. Abraham Lincoln said, if I had to cut down a tree, I would spend 90% of my time sharpening the axe and 10% cutting down the tree. And sometimes we just get so busy, we don't pause. We don't ask ourselves. Now, we need to learn to create. We are most like our creator when we are what? Tell me. We are most like our creator when we are creative. Right? One of the things that's troubling is that so many times we're on the fight, we're on the defense. We're always fighting this legislation or that legislation or this bigotry or that prejudice. And it keeps us so busy. It keeps us so busy that we don't have time to create. What happens to a football team that's on defense the whole game? They wear down, friends. They just pack it in and they give it up. I'd like to encourage all of us to think in terms of how do we create a different agenda. I know that there are sometimes we have to fight a battle. But how do we create this different agenda? And I want to be clear. Peace is not some sort of blind curtsy to injustice. Because there is injustice. We all understand that. At the same time, if we're always on the defensive and we're not on the offensive and we're not engaging and we're not being creative in our acts and we're not thinking in terms of, uh, you know, look, we have a nearly 50% high school dropout rate in the United States among our children. And it's time we start asking ourselves how much do we really love our families when we are not willing to graduate our own children from high school. And what is the future of our children? In, in Orange County, Florida, we have a 56% high school dropout rate among Puerto Ricanos. And it's time that all of us say, wait a minute. We're fighting all these battles out here against the Anglos, but what are we doing internally for our own people? We have to be serious about these matters. And that would, in fact, inspire. Now, I want to give you three very tangible steps, and we'll kind of wrap up. I think they're important steps. And here's the first one. We must be in spirit amongst ourselves. And for those of you who are good note takers, that's a good thing to do. <laughs> we must be in spirit amongst ourselves. And I think this is the first step. I also believe we must separate ourselves openly to truly come together. Unfortunately, the Nixon administration brought us all together in one super political group that we now call Hispanics in 1972. And we all know that Hispanic is only in America, right? Porque si usted es mexicano, usted es qué? Usted es mexicano. Y si uno es cubano, y si usted le dice a un cubano, Hondureño se ofende, ¿no? Y si usted dice a un hondureño, cubano, también se ofende. We are where we're from. And we are not one people group. We are bound together by language and elements of relational and familial harmony and desires and values. And now sometimes we can see something by seeing a negative. So I want to give you a negative. I have a friend in Orlando, Florida, who's a very sumamente destacado. And, and I want to show you, I want to tell you about a very uninspiring event. And this is amongst ourselves. Uh, this particular person uh, was poised to be the mayor of Orlando about eight years ago. He was the president of the Orlando, not the Hispanic, the Orlando Chamber of Commerce. The president of the Citrus Club, a very exclusive club. He is the number two ranking Latino in the United States in the Boy Scouts of America. He sits on the executive board of the Florida Board of Governors. And you know why he lost the mayoral race? 
because a Puerto Rican lady started a campaign, Ni Un Cubano Mas. And we must not separate ourselves. We must build each other up. And we have this group and we have that group and we have the other group and we have the other group and fine. At the same time, let's respect one another. To not do so is extremely uninspiring, is it not? So in our distinctiveness, we need to inspire and elevate one another. We must support, we must promote one another. And we must not throw each other under the guagua. <laughs> and we Latinos must understand that the Latino cause, the Latino cause is not a Democrat cause, it is not a Republican cause, it is a Latino cause. Yes. Amen? Amen? And there are issues on both sides of the political spectrum that are important to Latinos. And neither party fully represents our people. And I think that's an honest assessment. And we must not politically wedge our people for personal gain. And some of us have done so. And it is uninspiring. And it hurts our people. Step number two. We must be in spirit with other like-minded Americans, whether Anglos, African Americans, or Asians. We have a future mayoral candidate, African American. I think he stepped out. Who is it, please? <laughs> Can I talk with them? <laughs> We're wrapping up here. A good friend of mine, uh, Dallas Rohr, is, is here. Dallas, will you please stand? Please. <laughs> Dallas is a very, very successful business person here in Atlanta. And many years ago, he put some people in his company in our Spanish course with Bilingual America. And he sat in on a couple sessions. And, he took me aside, this was early 90s, I think, right? He took me aside and said, you know, Ricardo, you're, you're an excellent teacher. I think he said, great, but I'm not sure. What, what did you say? He said, <laughs> he said, Ricardo, you're an excellent teacher, but you don't know a thing about business. And I thought about it. And it's easy for us then to reject that, right? We're proud people. So I went back to him and I said, you know, you told me this, would you be willing to help me? Now, Dallas, has, your master's is in finance from Notre Dame, and I don't know, this guy is just too destacado. <laughs> and Dallas agreed, and he said, uh, here's my phone number, direct, anytime you need me, call me. Let's have lunch together. How many years did we go having lunch together, almost monthly? Dallas sat on my board of advisors for my company, and one day when I finally had enough money to buy him lunch, I looked at him and I said, Dallas, I have no idea how to repay you. And he looked at me and he said, you already have. And I said, how? He said, you cannot have any idea how much joy it brings to me to see your success and to see how much you've been able to help the Latino people. And this is an Anglo friends. Thank you. Now, I was doing a conference in Dallas, Texas, and there was a man there in his 60s, a true southerner. And you all know what I'm talking about, right? If we want to define the word xenophobia, this guy had it. He was not happy with me being there talking to this group about Latinos. You know, the old, they're in this country, da 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 you know. And he publicly um, made it known that he was not happy with it. The same man, two years later, doing a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, and this guy happened to be there. And before I got up to speak, the person who was introducing me, this guy puts his hands up. He's out now, he's just like one of you. And he puts his hand up, and he says, uh, before he speaks, I want to say something. And I'm going, ay Dios mío, okay. 
pero este tipo no deja, ¿no? <laughs> Machaco, you know? And, um, and the guy stood up. God is my witness. And he started to cry. And he said, I just want to tell everybody to listen. I didn't want to hear this, but I listened the last time and it changed my life and it changed my company. And I've learned to love these people. 60 some year old Southerner. And he died recently and Thomas Sproul, thankfully, is with other Latinos in heaven. And he likes them. <laughs> Sometimes rather than fighting people, we need to engage them. Sometimes we need to educate them. I have clearly seen thousands and thousands of Anglos who were confused learn to love our people. And I've had that privilege. So I see another sign, and it's an encouraging sign. And it's very, very inspiring to me. Now here's the last point and we're finished. And that is we must be in spirit with our nation as a whole. Because our cause is not solely a Latino cause, is it? We live in this great country. And I get very, very uneasy when I hear people talk about this Latino revolution and how we have, you know, we're going to get power and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. I don't know what we're going to take over, but you, you know what I'm saying? Because back in Kentucky, them's there's fighting words. <laughs> and you remember the Japanese general at the end of Tora, 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 and he says, I fear we have awakened the sleeping giant. <laughs> and sometimes rather than engaging and educating and elevating our own people, we have simply awakened a sleeping giant. And I think we must be very careful. And I think we must be in spirit to discern the best approach as we move forward. And I encourage you to think in these things now, I close with this, and I am really done. I appreciate your patience. When Latino leaders sincerely seek to educate and elevate our people from within, like the man in Oklahoma City, rather than thinking in terms of personal gain or recognition, when Latino leaders seek the partnership of willing Americans, of non-Latino ethnicity, for we are all Americans, right? And when Latino leaders openly put the well-being of the entire nation as their first and foremost love and allegiance, then we will have created a new leadership model for our people. And when we do these things, I believe we will, in fact, inspire this troubled nation. Que Dios le bendiga God bless you.